morning and welcome from me, me, Laura Goodfellow, to our fifth inclusive innovation webinar covering agri-tech and aquaculture. I'm Head of Business Engagement at Interface and we're delighted to be hosting this webinar in partnership with CEIS. So let me introduce you to who I have with me here on the panel. I've got Faisal Radic, the Business Director of Nordfrey, and Professor John Struthers from UWS and the Director of the Centre for African Research on Enterprise and Economic Development, Kirid. So you can, the purpose of the webinar series, of which this is the fifth, is to support and facilitate innovation across Scotland's third sector. We want to raise awareness around the resources that are available to you to help address societal and or environmental issues with your innovative ideas. For those that aren't aware of Interface, we provide a free service to individuals, organisations and businesses of all sizes in all sectors, matching them to Scotland's universities, colleges, research institutes, for a variety of different projects. We have access to world leading academic experts who are very interested in applied research. So looking into an idea or a challenge that someone has, researching a solution and making sure it is practical to implement. We can also provide advice and support on a range of funding options to help offset the cost of these projects, including the Innovation Voucher Funding Programme, which is designed to support a business working with academia. This is administered by Interface, but approved by the Scottish Funding Council. These schemes are good for initial projects, and the long-standing Innovation Voucher Scheme has more recently been supplemented by the Workforce Innovation Voucher. And this is in place for a really innovative review of how a business works and maximises its workforce effectiveness and productivity. So our concept isn't new, we've been on the go for 16 years now, and in that time we've reached almost 3,500 businesses and got over 2,650 projects with an academic partner off the ground. And this map shows the location of businesses that we have supported, and it shows the wide geographic reach across Scotland our team is based in different locations the length and breadth of Scotland, which gives us the opportunity to get to know areas and businesses better. The collaborative projects that we have facilitated have supported new product development, access to new markets, new processes, increased revenue and profits, and new ways of doing things. Maybe particularly important to consider just now as we move on to the fireside chat section of our webinar. So let me start with you in Isaac, tell me a little bit more about your organisation and what inspired you to set it up. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, so in terms of Nord Frey, um, we are a social enterprise. We registered in 2018 and based in Rwanda. Uh, and our, our mission statement is to offer smallholder farmers in East Africa, predominantly to begin with, uh, access to advanced farming solution in the form of aquaponics. And the idea is to significantly reduce malnutrition while significantly e increasing access to economic growth. And I, my background is in electrical engineering as a chartered engineer um, from, from Scotland, but I was in Kenya, Rwanda, doing work with engineers without borders. And, and that's where I came across Lars Hidadam, who's a CEO. His background is in the development and food technology. And he developed this concept in, in stakeholder management within uh, Rwanda since 2015. And kind of speaking with him and engaging, we kind of realized there's a, a real need for this type of solution that can significantly increase production um, in, in Rwanda and, and other developing countries. But the barriers to, you know, that they face is you know, access to income, access to finance, supply chain, um, and, and various other things. And from there, we kind of developed and, and, and established the company and um, looking to really address a, a big problem that exists there, um, but one that we think that we can tackle through giving access to, techno to te technology and developing the capacity within the country. Um, so what encouraged you to contact Interface in the first instance? So when I returned uh, so between Scotland and, and Rwanda, and when I was back in uh, Scotland, it must have been uh, 2000. 18 slash 19, I attended uh, the Catalyst um, around seven or eight, I think it was the, they had like a, an information day webinar uh, event and there, it actually I think is where I actually first met John uh, Struthers from UWS, but I was there just inquiring about the Innovate UK funding that was offered 
I, I happened to come across and speak to someone from KTN and discussing just you know what we're trying to do, try to raise funding, develop this technology that we have in the form of aquaponics and, and offer it to smallholder farmers. And he mentioned um, Interface and, and how they're a really good organization that could help partner us with, with academics. And, and so from there, started to inquire and then met um, people from Interface and learned a little bit more about the organization and just found it really easy to engage with them. Um, and then from there, develop a relationship with academics um, at various different universities from there. So it's, it's mostly through through networking um, and then just understanding that it's actually a rare service that not many other countries seem to offer. Absolutely. So it sounds quite fortuitous that you were at the event there and bumped into somebody from KTN. Yeah, very much so. And um, I think also, yeah, also met John and before I even realised I was going to end up working with him. So it's, I think those events um, definitely paid off for us. Absolutely. So if I can turn to you now, John, can you outline how the team at UWS are supporting the development of the feedback sensor system, you know, and how it works? Well, yes, uh, Laura's and uh, just to begin by thanking uh, Interface and CEIS for inviting us to to this this meeting, this webinar. Yeah, we, we met at that Interface meeting in Edinburgh, uh, probably would have been 2018 or yeah, 2018 stroke 19. And just a little background about uh, our center, Center for African Research on Enterprise and Economic Development, CARID as we call it. You know, we, we are engaged in research on enterprise in Africa, but we're also and have secured some funded research and this project is, is one of them. It's a major one for us actually. And uh, when, we, when I attended the the meeting, I suppose it was a bit like a speed dating uh, arrangement where you so I don't know who you're going to meet and I didn't know I was going to meet uh, Faisal and vice versa for him. So I, I think it was pretty clear that in the discussion that we were having, that there was good potential for complementarity between, you know, what I knew about Nordfry at that time. And I know a lot more about it now course and the expertise that, that we have in the, the university not just in the center but you know across the whole university I mean you probably know that UWS has had a an excellent history and reputation for applied research you know we do do blue skies research but most of our research is very applied and this project is a good example of that because uh, you may come in come on to this topic later but 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 what we bring to the project at UWS is a combination. I'm an economist myself, and uh, in the business school, we have a couple of colleagues contributing to the project. One is a supply chain logistics specialist, and another is a big expert on female, female enterprise in Africa. Uh, they're both Africans. One is from Tanzania and one is from Nigeria. And then we have two, what I call proper scientists, uh, a computing scientist, a professor of computing, and also a professor of, um, this is not the exact title, but I call him the fish biologist. He's the expert on fish because aquaponics is about fish and veg vegetables in, in a combined uh, in, in environment. So we have a team of five that uh, we brought to the table, as it were. And then, of course, Nordfry has, has its own expertise on the ground in Rwanda, including, of course, Faisal here who comes from a, an engineering background. So when, when we looked at the, the prospect of developing a project, we thought, well, there's a great synergy here between all of us at UWS and uh, Nordfry itself. And you know, I could get into a bit more detail on how that has worked out over the last two years, because we've been working now in this project almost to the day, Faisal, nearly two years. <laughs> through the pandemic. And uh, you may ask some questions about that later, but uh, I think uh, that's that's a brief summary of how we started the, the so project. In the, in the beginning, you're having this conversation with Faisal and is your brain just going, we could do this, we could do this, we could pull on this team. And that's why you kind of like, it was attractive to be involved in the project from the outset. Yeah, I, I mean, I think because we run the African center, you know, it was in Africa, number one, that, that uh, was a big plus. Uh, we do have some involvement with Rwanda anyway, quite apart from this project. So that was another another plus. And 
with regard to the centre, our centre, we, we, we do need to develop projects that are funded uh, externally. And, you know, the level of funding that we got for this project was quite good, actually. And so, so we were very happy about that. And we are, we are a new centre, quite new, five years, five, six years old. So this particular project is a major thing for us. We, we, have, a, we have another project in Kenya, which is uh, not... not uh, not not funded by, by this particular route, but but that's more of a, what we call a knowledge training partnership. Again, in the agricultural sector, because we do quite a bit, bit of work in that in that sector. But the fact that we could bring together these five different components, myself as an economist, the gender aspect is very important. Gender and social inclusion is really really important, and also the logistics part, plus of course the scientific part with our computing science colleagues. And uh, on the biology side, because we're developing a tester kit uh, using sensor equipment um, without going into too much technical detail. It's very, very interesting. And I've learned a lot, actually, uh, myself about how aquaponic systems operate, which I knew nothing about before. So absolutely. And obviously there's the, the kind of the, the financial side, which is important. But why else is it important for UWS to support organisations such as Nordfree? Very good question. I, mean, I, th I think we, we have we have our own mission, you know, as a university, we, we, we have to do research, you know, so we have to try and publish papers, we have to um, produce output that is uh, classified as research, you know. Um, but working with a company is, 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 is meat and drink to our university, we've been doing it for over 100 years, and we've got a very good reputation of doing that. So working with any company is nothing new for us. So, so we 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 thought. Um, well, as I said before, I think it it hit all the right uh, uh, messages for us because we have an excellent experience um, in the university working with companies. We're one of the leading KTP providers in the UK. I think we're third top in the UK. I think we're the top in Scotland. So it, it was kind of a natural a natural thing for us. For us to do now, of course, Nordfry has uh, its objectives, which are are more, if you like, uh, commercially orientated, because they want to make this into a, a viable, vibrant business beyond the lifetime of this project. Which, which I and you're, you're you're linking me in nicely because I'm just about to jump back to Faisal. Um, and as Faisal, what do you think you know is the is the hardest thing for a social entrepreneur when it comes to collaborating with the university? Yeah, so as a social uh, enterprise in general, there's lots of like interesting challenges. Like we have um, the challenge of trying to develop a strong team in Rwanda. So myself and Lars um, are um, come from a kind of private sector background and have that experience, but we're also looking to develop and, and have been developing our team in country um, and with local Rwandans, which is really good. I think it also challenging in general just to get access to funds and, and things like that. And so when it comes to partnering with universities, um, I think probably the key challenge, first of all, uh, and I think why actually Interface probably helps really challenge, uh, tackle that is, first of all, getting in touch and contact with universities and, and understanding what is the 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 capacity and and the the knowledge that is available to access um like i say we we kind of looked at different countries uh, in europe and even in rwanda east africa to, to partner and, and we've done well with identifying really good expertise who publish and are well known but there's definitely like uh, other areas and other academics that we're not aware of and so first of all i think interface made that really easy we produced a brief in terms of what we're looking for these are projects that we have and then they you know interface with all the you know, academics and made it really easy because they came back to us with people who were interested in and yeah we wouldn't I mean I met John at the meeting but otherwise um if it wasn't for that I, I wouldn't have known to go to UWS for for a lot of the, the expertise that they offer uh, and from what we can see um very few other European countries offer anything like that um in Denmark there's something that's happening I think it's called the access to innovation and maybe kind of replicates a little bit of what, what interface offer, but that's probably the, the main challenge, knowing that people exist in the first place to contact. And then from there, it's about accessing the, the, the funding, I guess, to 
um, facilitate some of those really interesting projects that we've got. Um, and so this was really good for us to develop and build our aquaponic starter kit farm in Rwanda. So we're in the process of, of building that now. We've completed the solar works uh, and uh, in the process of building fish tanks and stuff. And again, that's been facilitated through this project. And then also, hopefully, once that's done, we can overlay the technology that's been developed by UWS. So again, having that expertise to kind of support through that has been probably quite good. I think without it, um, we would have been, um, I guess, having to look to the private sector uh, and maybe not been as clear as to what's been available. So I think um, just, just getting transparency is probably the difficult part with academics. But I'm pleased to say on the back of it, we, we do have a really good network now. I think it's becoming a lot easier now that we, we kind of know the process of how to do it. Absolutely. And we, you know, we spoke to John and he was saying about how the, the different team that he that was pulled in. And when you sat with your kind of wish list at the beginning, would you have had all of those people on the wish list or did the project sort of almost evolve through discussions and say, like, oh, we could do that. We'll pull in somebody else. So it was like face to face discussions just helping frame everything. Yeah, I think it was really, really beneficial that I was here and able to meet with uh, the UWS team in person, but we also had you know the Rwanda team um, calling as well. And uh, I think part of it started off just with a bit of an idea, like from our side commercially, we understood what we were trying to do in terms of technology. But I think that was like the starting point. And then from there, when we spoke with John and, and others, they brought in the gender and social inclusion element, they brought in the economics and logistics element, um, brought, in, uh, brought in some of the fish health element as well. So those were like, all added in on top of what was the starting point of, of the sensors, um, which, which is basically a, uh, an array of non-invasive sensors that re kind of report and monitor the, the health of the farm at all times. So it means that we can do the kind of high-tech backend analysis and, and then interface with the, the farmers with kind of simple kind of uh, instructions to make sure that they maximize production. So that's really important to the operating of the farm. Um, but then all those additional bits and pieces just really help um, I guess, add value and, and make sure it's like the user interface is correct and, and that they're, they're getting the value that they need and addressing the, the key challenges uh, when it comes to logistics and, and, and gender and social inclusion, which is a big part of what we do, especially because in Rwanda, um, at least 70% of the, the workforce in agriculture are female. Um, so making sure that we, we kind of have them at the heart of our solution is, is definitely key and important for us as well. So that UWS interaction with that has been really valuable as well. Absolutely. And, it, and it's maybe too big a question. And we've obviously touched on them like throughout the kind of conversation. But what, what other benefits, what would be the benefits that you've said they've been realised to date? I think through this project, I, there's, there's been lots of, of, um, of really good benefits, actually. I think, um, I don't know um, if, Joe, if you can bring up this slide um, and it can maybe just highlight some of the traction that we've had uh, today and it can maybe run through um, just a snippet of, of where we've got to today. So this slide just shows our kind of journey today and then this project has actually been a key part of it. So we, like I said, we registered in 2018. We did our own kind of um, customer journey beforehand and, and then 2019 we, we partnered with UWS and Innovate and since then we're being able to facilitate uh, the kind of hiring of our team to, to implement this project. We purchased land, we completed our design through our a big part of what we do with UWS has been um, the stakeholder survey engagement. So we can carry out uh, up to 350 surveys with smallholder farmers and also retailers uh, in Rwanda. And so through that, we were able to get MOUs with some of the kind of biggest and best um, wholesalers in Rwanda for import export. We then also were able to trial some, some um, traditional farming methods of uh, growing sweet peas, and that just allows us to provide a comparison to when we do the aquaponic farming and show how much better we can produce. Um, and then we also started the kind of building of, of the MVP, the minimal viable products, which um, is, is now close to being finished. And so in terms of that, it's allowed for employment for local uh, about 20 to 40 farmers and, and labourers since since March full time, which is really good and important for us. So in terms of the benefits, you can see that we've gained a lot of information, just uh, documented data from, from engaging with these farmers um, through qualitative and quantitative surveys. And that's just been fed back into our solution, which is improving all the time. 
and also just being able to actually build and, and make something tangible through the project um, and, and use the funding to build um, our, our MVP, which is really important to us uh, and kind of allows the sensors to then hopefully be implemented on top of soon. Uh, I know that UBS have, have got some prototypes made, so they'll hopefully be uh, installed and we'll start collecting data and proving the value of this type of system. So and it's kind of, we are you know, doing things separately, but this this project is definitely a kind of key thread throughout the last two years of our you know of us as a business um and so without it, it it would it wouldn't be it'd be a very different business actually um so really pleased with the benefits that we've managed to extract from it today no that's fantastic and that slide is brilliant it's just showing the journey and kind of putting in the milestones and the steps just to bring it to life for everybody i'm going to jump back to you john um because across like sort of UWS, there's many and varied collaborations. So what are your top tips for kind of getting the most from a collaboration, both from the business perspective and the kind of academic UWS team? Well, I think I think you I think you were looking for three tips. So so I'll suggest three. Um, I, I think flexibility is very important. Um, and that, that's been brought to the fore in the last couple of years, well, the last 18 months with the pandemic. Um, we have to be flexible as, as universities to allow a project to evolve um, with the, the vagaries of what's happening in the world. This is even pre-pandemic times because, as Pfizer's already said, you know, companies like Nordfry have their own mission and we have our mission as, as well, um, which is a little different from, from, from Nordfry's. And although there's quite a big overlap, there's a good Venn diagram sort of overlap there. So I think flexibility is important. Resilience is also important. Resilience, and I think we, we can all uh, concur with that over the last year and a half, you know, that we've all had to be resilient in coping with the, the pandemic. Bear in mind that, you know, we had planned to visit Rwanda, part of the funding that we received was to, to visit Rwanda. We haven't been able to do so. So there's been a lot of toing and froing and, and uh, uh, indirectly this has had, and this is the third sort of learning point, I think, which I would suggest is that unintended consequences of the pandemic have been positive. So for example, give, give you an example on the slide that Faisal showed brings this out quite well, you know, the work that we would have done as academics in carrying out these surveys, because we, we have achieved remarkable responses. Over 340 farmers and retailers have been contacted in the last, well, four or five months, I think. Uh, that's been delayed because of various things. We would have normally traveled to Rwanda several times, you know, over that period, and we haven't been able to travel. So this has allowed what I've called unintended, positive unintended consequences on the ground in, in Rwanda. And uh, some of the people in one of the photographs that Faisal showed you are some of the, the younger people who have been employed on the project, um, who've learned a lot and developed uh, greatly, we think. So that, that's a spin-off, if you like, <laughs> that probably might not have happened if we hadn't had the pandemic and we'd be, we would have been able to fly there and do all this research ourselves. So there's a really important lesson there, I think, uh, which uh, I, I think, you know, might, might continue into the future, even, even if hopefully we don't have a, another pandemic. And I really do, do believe in that because there is a tendency, you know, when it comes to Africa, to think that only we can help them, but it's not like that. It's a two-way street. I describe it as a dual carriageway rather than a single track road. And, and you know, I've worked in Africa for over 40, in and on Africa over for 40 years. And I'm so impressed by the resilience of our colleagues in, in Rwanda, who have also faced the, the pandemic, by the way, and I've had curfews and things like that. So, I mean, I think this particular project is sort of a sort of archetypal project that um, could um, represent pro oh, different types of projects over the last couple of years, you know, in a very extreme form, of course. I mean, we should have actually finished the project 
in April, <laughs> but it's been extended, I think, now three times, hasn't it, uh, Faisal? And, and, you know, we've had to adapt to that. In fact, we've written a paper on that part alone. You know, we've written a paper on how to cope with an international development project during a time of pandemic. We've submitted it to a journal. We're waiting for a response. So oh, it's it, amazing, it, it, amazing to hear how that goes. And I am conscious of time, but I'm going to be a little bit selfish and I've got another couple of questions for you. But in the meantime, if everyone has um, any questions, if anyone's got any questions, just add them into the chat and we will kind of get to them. Um, Faisal, I'm going to jump to you because I want to know what's the, pro what's the project achieved that you're most proud of to date? Uh, um, good question. I mean, there's a lot to actually reflect and be proud of. I think um, the team that we've developed um, through through the project and getting them involved in surveys and farm development and things, um, you know, they're a key part of our company as well, but they're facilitated a little bit in, in working on the project that we have with UWS. I think really proud of the, the local content that we have. I think also in terms of um, the fact that we're now like a, I'd say a leading social enterprise in aquaponics in Rwanda. And I think the credibility that we have has been increased through working with Innovate and, and UWS. Uh, academics has been really good. But I think probably just the, a little bit on the resilience or, or the, the what's been achieved during the last year has actually been really quite impressive. Um, given that Rwanda did face, face um, lockdowns and curfews uh, more stringent than, than what we probably face here in the UK um, and still being able to get out and implement the surveys with hundreds of farmers still being able to buy like borders were short so in, in terms of getting uh, our materials and things like that through um, was difficult and challenging so for us to then still be able to get it through now and, and build roughly in the timelines that we we kind of readapted to like as John said we we've been pushed and delayed so I guess a fair amount with with the pandemic but I think just being able to persevere and, and still produce what is a challenging time where we are has been really really positive and I think that's probably um, as we're getting close to now finishing um, the build and hopefully operating it soon and have something very tangible to show I think that will be probably the, the key defining point for us. Um, I'm really proud of the team that we have managed to achieve it, um, given given those challenges. Um, that and plus we actually also produced veg um, and, and uh, on, on the farm a few months ago. So that was like a defining point, being able to have something, you know, tangible and revenue generated. The, the I think the day that we get to eat fish is probably the, the kind of milestone point for me though. Um, so I think that's one that we're still working towards, but hopefully I think in the next few months we'll get there. No, it's an incredible story and both you and, and John have spoken about resilience, flexibility, adaptability. Um, and I'm going to guess without putting words in your mouth that kind of communication and a strong team has been key and, and instrumental in that because if there wasn't that kind of two way communication and everyone driving the same way. It, it wasn't going to happen. No, definitely. I, I mean, it's been really helpful, um, the whole remote working situation, I guess, all over in that push. Like Rwanda's now got really good um, internet uh, access. And so that's uh, through 3G, 4G around the country. And that's really helped, especially like we're an international team. We have people that support from across Europe and, and America now. And having that kind of communication channel with with Lars and the team in Rwanda, um, without it, I don't know how we would do a lot of what we're doing. Um, so that's been really positive. And then having the communication here in the UK is also really good for, for us understanding how to um, just develop the solution that we have for UWS and, and other universities. So I think um, if this happened a few years ago, I'm not entirely sure how, how we would have done this. Maybe it's through postcards and whatever, or not, I'm not sure. But thankfully, not an issue that we have to deal with. No, that's in case. And we've got some, we have got some questions coming through. But I just, before we kind of move to them, is there anything else that you, Faisal or John, you know, want to add that we've missed at a point that you want to tease out at all? Yeah, just, just one quick point, to Laura, that... Um, you know, it's a sort of learning experience, isn't it, for all of us? You know, we, we're academics and we, we're in the business of learning. Uh, and the ongoing project, even with all the problems of communication and extending the project, and even, you know, we had to deal with a, a budget cut because, as you may know, the UK government uh, last year, this year, 
cut its overseas aid budget. Um, actually, the Chancellor yesterday suggested it's going to reverse it in a couple of years, so they're going back to 0.7 of GDP. So we've had a lot of problems to deal with, which uh, we've managed to cope with quite well. And I think it is it is about team teamwork and playing to our different strengths. And, you know, in a, in a university context, you know, as you probably realize, universities are big institutions and often there are silos between departments and faculties. And here on this project, uh, we have at least, I think it's three faculties at our university involved. You know, the science faculty, the computing faculty and our, our business school where, where I am. And that, that alone is a, a learning process. So it's a case of what we ha what the challenge is now is to promote it and to disseminate that these achievements. And as the I'm the leader of this project, I'm the project manager. That, that's my biggest headache, actually. You know, I, I I'm so busy. Even even this morning, I had a meeting. We had a meeting about the project uh, nine o'clock this morning on the on the computing side, and so I'm busy dealing with the day to day management of the project and. It's really useful that I've got a research assistant assigned and funded by the project um, who helps me with the administration of it and tries to disseminate it properly. Uh, and that, that's, that's a thing that we academics often are not very good at because we like to do the research, but we don't blow our own trumpets <laughs> as much as perhaps we should. Uh, but we're learning. We're learning to do that now. So I think I'd, I'd just make that uh, comment, Laura. No, absolutely. And we, we fully intend to kind of share the story across uh, social media and by follow up as well. So it'll help a little bit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if I've got maybe just sorry. Time to add. Oh, I don't know if I can add something there just to say. No, absolutely. Yeah, sure. So I, I think, um, yeah, lots of positive. I think really supportive and thankful for, for having um the access to to these kind of platforms I, I think for us what we learned probably most is just the the value in partnerships it's very core to what we do as a company um we're in the process like i say of building our mvp we'll, we'll scale this up to a full flagship farm and then we're going to scale up to 32 outgrow farms with smallholder farmers within three to five years and with the infrastructure and the, the kind of the landscape in rwanda there is i guess gaps but also opportunities to partner i think that's where we're now really and, and so if anyone is is interested in, in partnering or, or thinking of, you know is there value in it we really strongly recommend it and looking to, to kind of further develop that with universities or even other UK companies to, to kind of build the momentum that we've started and continue on that um, because we were getting a lot of interest in projects and, and kind of collaborations as a result of that kind of approach um, and that it just kind of builds on what we already know is, is a good way to do it with Innovate and um, UWS and, and Interface and others. So um, that's probably our, our kind of keen takeaway from it all. And if anyone's interested to get in touch with us as well, because we like to keep kind of partnering with, with people like that in that manner. Absolutely. And thank you, Faisal. And I think you've maybe done us a wee bit of a favour in time, a uh, time scale there, because your kind of summary has also answered the kind of question that we've got, which is about, you know, what's the impact had on the farmer and farmers and local community and, and what's next. Thank you so much to uh, Faisal and John for taking the time out um, to speak to us and tell the story. Um, don't be sending a follow-up email later on um, with contact details, you know, because obviously Faisal seems to get in touch as well. But if you get in touch with us, we can make any connections that you're looking for and included in that will be the slides um, of the webinar. Um, so thank you everybody again for taking the time and please do get in touch.